We're so glad every two weeks it comes pretty quickly. Thank God, because I miss all of you. And remember, anybody that you see on these screens, they're in your family. You can touch them. You can write them a little chat. You can say, hey, where are you located? Maybe you're in the same state. This is really a place for people to unite and find a common cause and to find common support. That, well, that's our heart. That's our heart desire because we didn't really have the support when we were going through the situation. And now that we've started this organization, we see how many other people need that support. So we're showing up for you every two weeks. And we're sure glad that you're showing up here for us. That just makes us understand that what we're doing is important, needed, especially for the caregivers. You know, everybody needs support. Sometimes it's your whole family, and not sometimes, it's usually your whole family that needs support. And that's what everything ALS is about. One other program we just started called Caring ALS. If you haven't looked at it, it's caringals.com. And there you're gonna find support for medical financial needs, which is a extremely important part of stress reduction. So be sure to visit those two places. And especially if you go to YouTube, Everything ALS, you'll have a record of all of our videos. So anytime you can't make one of the meetings, just go to the website and you'll have all the information right there. So welcome aboard. And as many of you can imagine that you have brothers and sisters all over this planet. When you come to our website and you look at the map and you see all those little buttons popping up all over the planet, that's when you realize we're a global family. That's pretty important. I've never touched so many people around the world that, is, that has been touched through this organization. And guess what? You're a major part of the organization. It's because each of you pass on to the other folks who need our help. You pass on everythingals.org. Thank you, folks. Thank you, McFinn. You have the magic touch and it's, it's always great to kick off our webinars um, with your energy and your thoughtfulness. So thank you for that. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving and getting quality time, even if it was a small group with friends or family um, while we are all navigating through COVID. Um, our Everything ALS team is really thankful to give our community the opportunity to hear from top researchers in ALS that come and present to you guys on our bi-monthly webinars. We're excited for our next speaker, so please welcome Dr. Robert Bowser. Um, Dr. Bowser is the Chief Scientific Officer, Professor and Chairman of Neurobiology and Director of the Gregory W. Fulton ALS and Neuromuscular Research Center at the Barrow Neurological Institute and St. Joseph's Hospital and Medi Medical Center in Arizona. That was a tongue twister. <laughs> Dr. Bowser is an internationally recognized leader in ALS research and some of his contributions include pioneering efforts to discover and validate biomarkers for ALS. So his laboratory is recognized for its work on biomarkers that can be used as diagnostic indicators of the disease, predictors of the disease progression, and also in determining the effectiveness of drugs in clinical trials. 
So without further ado, thank you for taking the time to come and speak with our community this evening. We are so excited to hear what you have to say and hear about your research efforts. So thank you, the floor is yours, take it away. Thank you so much, Lisa. I uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity to, to be with you tonight and to present some of our work and actually some of the work from others as well. Um, um, so yeah, so today, as Lisa said, I'm going to talk about um, biomarkers in, in ALS and how um, over the past number of years, we've come to both identify new ones, validate some, and then use them in a, a number of different paradigms. And, I, and I'll talk to you uh, about a few examples of those. First, real quickly, disclosures. So I actually have started a few different companies in, in this space. Um, one is Iron Horse Diagnostics, where we're trying to take some of those biomarkers and make them commercially available and used um, in the clinic. Uh, prior one was Cannot Biosciences, which with Biogen used, uh, uh, pushed a drug called Dexpromipraxel through phase three. And then I consult for a number of, of companies and list many of those here. So I don't need to talk about ALS here. Um, especially to this group, but really the, the only key things I wanted to mention here, which are relevant for today's discussion is really, you know, diagnosis can take up to a year. Um, unfortunately, the, the diagnosis typically from diagnosis of death is two to five, but obviously it's very, quite variable. Uh, it can be well over a decade and sometimes two. And so it's a very heterogeneous disease. And that becomes problematic when we're trying to find therapies for it. Um, and about 10% of those, or maybe a little bit more than 10% are familial um, in nature and the rest are all sporadic. We don't quite know um, what triggered the disease and, and how it's progressing. And unfortunately, we only have two approved drugs, FDA approved drugs that modestly slow disease progression. So there's a great need um, to expand our repertoire of drugs. And many years ago, I, I thought that biomarkers might be a way to help us solve some of these problems. And so, you know, some of the goals that we have for biomarkers and, you know, for those that may not know, I mean, what is a biomarker? It's really anything that you can measure um, in a person, an individual. It could be in a fluid like blood or cerebral spinal fluid. It could be a physiologic measure. It could be your force vital capacity. Um, so lots of things, anything that you can measure reliably can be used as a biomarker. And I started in this area for biomarkers looking at ALS probably 20 years ago. Um, and at that time, I was really interested in finding some that might be um, useful in uh, providing earlier diagnosis, um, maybe some that would predict the course of disease. Um, and given this disease heterogeneity, I was really interested in identifying markers that could stratify the disease population. That is, can take a very heterogeneous disease and group people in the patterns that, be, that they themselves become more homogeneous in nature. Because that is, the, that, that is really a goal for this particular disease. If we have particular drugs that we're moving into the clinic, well, we want to treat the most homogeneous population of individuals uh, to see whether or not that drug is effective. And ideally, you'd want to treat um, uh, patients with a particular drug that actually have alterations in the pathway that that drug actually targets. And so we can use biomarkers to try to find and stratify the disease population and identify those that might best respond. Obviously, markers can identify ins or provide insights into disease pathogenesis and really um, can aid in drug development process, either as new targets or in preclinical studies to make sure that the drug is doing what you think is actually happening. And really happy to report that any, that probably within the last, oh, at least six or seven years, um, really in the world of ALS, um, having biomarkers uh, as a, in a parallel pathway as part of the drug development process is occurring both um, in the academic world and also in industry. And really, that's a follow up to what has happened for many years in the oncology space. Um, but now we're doing this in the world of ALS as well. And also trying to use biomarkers to improve clinical trial design. Again, taking this very heterogeneous disease population and really trying to figure out 
who would be the best type, best individuals to treat with a particular drug or drug combination? And then finally, can we use biomarkers to sort of predict treatment outcomes and effects? And these are called uh, pharmacodynamic biomarkers. That is, the drug is actually hitting its target and this biomarker is demonstrating that it's actually impacting in the way, hopefully, in which you want that drug to have to, to uh, impact. So current efforts in ALS biomarkers, again, you know, my lab's been part of this for a number of years. Um, we're really, you know, unfortunately, and in, in my lab is, is, is also um, uh, guilty of this, we typically look at one class of markers within any one study. So you could use genetics and people will do large se uh, genome sequencing studies um, and look for genes that are participating or, or uh, contributing to ALS. You could look at different proteins and measure protein levels and look for proteins that um, are related to ALS or maybe even metabolites. And we've done this in a number of studies, looking at different metabolic signatures of ALS patients. And a lot of studies, especially historically, have been what we call cross-sectional in study. That is, we take one sample. Um, in, in the case of genetics, obviously, it's a blood sample and you do genetic analysis on it. But maybe in proteins, it's maybe a blood sample. So you take one sample from a patient, um, you have a clinical history often, but you have one sample from that patient. More recently, probably in the last five years or so, we've moved to, to, to include more longitudinal studies. And, that, and really, that has been dependent upon some of our clinical research studies that are collecting um, longitudinal blood and or CSF and or urine samples that are all linked to clinical information from patients over time. And so those types of studies are incredibly valuable as we move forward um, in the use of biomarkers for ALS and actually the study of ALS. Obviously biomarkers in genetic subtypes and um, more recently, again, looking at actually pre-symptomatic patients. So um, individuals that harbor genetic mutations that we know cause ALS, but are still asymptomatic and then following those individuals longitudinally in order to see when do they first develop clinical symptoms of the disease. And can we actually look in maybe blood samples that were collected prior to symptom onset and ask, are any biomarkers or any changes that we can see in that blood sample even before symptom onset? Can we identify anything that would really help us identify um, the earliest time point in which disease starts? and then incorporating biomarkers into clinical trials. And now um, most clinical trials in ALS are using different types of biomarkers um, for secondary outcome measures within their trials. I mean, next steps um, for ALS biomarkers are really combining lots of biomarker subtypes. So, you know, now trying to combine genetics and proteins, metabolites and other types of biomarkers and using more um, sort of AI types of analytical approaches um, to identify either risk factors or, may, or combinations of biomarkers that make the best predictions um, to again, gain more uh, mechanistic insights, but also to help in our trial design and ultimately as, as new outcome measures of trials. And then finally, as uh, a precision medicine programs for the treatment of individual patients. So we, can we really um, use a precision medicine approach to ultimately provide optimal treatment for individual patients. And again, I think that that's on the horizon. So briefly, a little outline of, of the presentation tonight, I'm gonna talk a bit and mention a few um, uh, examples of protein-based biomarkers um, to help in either aiding diagnosis or stratifying different patient subtypes. And then, picking on a couple of different inflammatory markers that we have used to select patients in a particular clinical trial, review some of the genetic biomarkers and how they're now being used and targeted for treatments, and then finally some ongoing studies and future directions. So at the moment, really the best biochemical biomarkers for ALS really are these neurofilament proteins. So neurofilaments are made in the neurons in your central nervous system. And they, um, when neurons are damaged or die, they release their, com their um, components, neurofilaments being one of those proteins. 
So you can measure neurofilament levels in cerebral spinal fluid or in the blood. If it's in the blood, it has to come from the central nervous system because um, that's the only place that, that neurofilament proteins are made. Neurofilament proteins are fairly resistant to, to degradation, and so they remain in these biofluids for some time. And so you can develop assays to actually measure these types of proteins. And there are a few different types, um, neurofilament heavy chain and light chain. And these have been extensively examined by lots of labs around the world as biomarkers for ALS. And it, this is just an example from, from uh, some data from my lab um, and really looking again at, at, at cross-section of sporadic ALS patients and just looking at neurofilament levels in the CSF and comparing it to obviously healthy controls, which have very little. So it's a great separator of the healthy control population. But in this case, we looked specifically at pure lower motor neuron disease patients and pure upper motor neuron disease patients. So these are appropriate disease mimics if we wanna to try to predict who has ALS and who doesn't. And so neurofilament levels are much higher in ALS patients versus these other two disease mimics. And so it gave us some um, really good positive data indicating that levels of this protein might be quite useful as a predictive tool uh, for who has ALS and who might have other types of, of neurologic diseases. So that one company I mentioned, Iron Horse Diagnostics, so we've validated some of these assays in a clinical lab and now starting to make those commercially available um, for use in clinical trials and working with a lot of companies to do that and ultimately um, for early for an aid for diagnosis for, for patients coming in the clinics um, for their first clinic visit. This is some data from a paper we published earlier this year. And again, just looking at these neurofilament proteins in either cerebral spinal fluid um, or blood. And here, now we're looking at either non-ALS controls, and this includes um, some of the disease controls, but now looking at patients that are either just slow progressors or fast progressors, or patients that harbor the repeat expansion within the C9 gene. And so if you look across these neurofilament proteins, you see a very striking and similar pattern. And that is, if you're a fast progressor, you have more neurofilament um, in your biofluids than a slow progressor, which has more than a uh, neurologic disease control. But if you're a patient with a C9 repeat expansion, you look more like a fast progressor than a slow progressor, at least for the level of neurofilament. So again, looking and trying to stratify patient populations based just, this is just based off of um, rate of disease progression using clinical parameters. This is a study uh, we published at the end of last year. And this was using, um, in collaboration with Michael Benatar at the University of Miami, where Michael has been following for some time individuals that harbor mutations in genes that cause ALS, but yet are asymptomatic. And then following them over time, um, and then again, looking to when they become symptomatic, when do they first exhibit symptoms that um, a neurologist would call as, yep, they have ALS. And so in this case, that point at which they become symptomatic is time zero. And here, what I'm showing is that using either blood samples or, or cerebral spinal fluid, we see uh, evidence for lots of patients that have elevated levels of neurofilament um, over what one sees in, in the control population, which is in the gray. And so you see evidence of neurofilament levels increasing in either blood or in the CSF up to three years before the actual patient has symptoms. And so it's really the first example of looking at a particular biomarker and showing that we can start to see elevations in individuals even before the clinical onset of symptoms. And so this is quite exciting and uh, might provide information about even individuals that harbor these genetic mutations, when should they first be treated um, with uh, potential therapies? However, the downside of neurofilaments are that, you know, that they're not specific to ALS. And this, I just pulled out some titles from very recent studies looking at neurofilament levels, predicting um, clinical outcomes for patients with multiple sclerosis. Uh, it's a great biomarker for traumatic brain injuries because obviously when you have a brain injury, it damages neurons, it releases a lot of neurofilaments. 
Um, it also is quite good at predicting mortality in patients with stroke. So these proteins are increased in the blood and CSF under a number of conditions. So again, it's, it's not useful as a, as a pure diagnostic just for ALS versus anything else. Um, it's, it is actually quite good if you start to have some symptoms um, and you're seeing a neurologist, we can make good predictions on who has ALS and, pro and who probably doesn't. But in the general population, it would not be useful as a, as a predictor for ALS. It would be quite good though, for the general population, if you had neurofilament levels in your blood, it wouldn't say that you had ALS. It would just tell you that you should go see a neurologist because you have a neurological problem. And this is just some data looking at neurofilament levels across the host of different neurodegenerative diseases. Again, just highlighting that um, if you look here, ALS right in the middle, while it is a wide um, uh, degree of, of, of measure within various individuals, the average amount is actually higher than in all these other neurodegenerative diseases. So there's a lot of crossover. And so again, you could predict or make, make a prediction, but it would not be highly specific for ALS um, when you include all these other neurodegenerative diseases. Now, if we look at different inflammatory um, proteins, and so these are obviously markers that inflammation is occurring within the individual. Again, this is just looking at a set of these in both the cerebral spinal fluid and the blood. And again, trying to separate either slow versus fast progressors and then including C9. So it's from the same paper I showed you uh, a few minutes ago. And one can see that if you look at this protein called IL-18, um, it functions in very specific types of inflammatory pathways. In many patients with fast progressors, it's higher than in slow progressors, very similar to C9 patients. It's not an all or, or nothing though, because you definitely have a few patients that are fast progressors that don't have elevated IL-18. So it is probably trying to tell you something that in these patients, this pathway is not really involved in the disease process in that individual. So you can see different types of examples of different inflammatory cytokines that fit different profiles. And interestingly enough, even um, trends that occur within the in this case, the cerebral spinal fluid that, that are somewhat the opposite that occurs within the blood. And so you start to get the sense that the inflammatory pathways happening in the periphery may not be identical to the inflammatory pathways that are happening in the central nervous system um, within the ALS patient population. So again, some of these can be used to help stratify patients in the disease progression rates or specific genetic uh, subtypes of the disease. So now I'm going to tell you about um, a clinical trial we ran for the last couple of years here through the Barrow, but it was a multi-site study, um, and the other sites are listed down here. And this was a, a phase two study looking um, at a particular drug, tocilizumab, in ALS patients. And this is an example of how we used inflammatory biomarkers within a clinical trial. So as I just highlighted, neuroinflammation is occurring in ALS patients. Lots of different factors that are involved in inflammation are increased in either the blood or CSF of, of patients. Um, one such of, the, of these cytokines is called IL-6. It's involved in a, in a specific signaling pathway and in inflammation. It contributes to the change and switch from a more neuroprotective to a neuro, more of a neurotoxic type of glial protein, the microglia. This um, drug called, the uh, trade name is Ectemra, is a humanized monoclonal antibody that blocks and binds to the IL-6 receptor. So basically tries to block IL-6 signaling. It's already FDA approved. It's, it's approved for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so it's essentially it's injected within the joint. Um, so we had data actually from a collaborator showing that if you take out um, peripheral cells out of an ALS patient, and if you block um, using Ectemra, you can reduce the inflammatory cytokine production out of those um, cells. So the idea was, well, maybe we can use this as a treatment in ALS to block IL-6 signaling, um, because that might then shift the, uh, reduce the amount of these neurotoxic 
microglia that are occurring within ALS patients in reduce and slow down motor neuron cell death. Now IL-6 is only upregulated in a subset of patients. And so this is another example of why these biomarkers then can be used to look and identify and stratify the patient population that only treat those that actually have elevated IL-6 um, signaling. And so in our study design, that's exactly what we did. And so at all the sites, there was um, uh, blood samples that were collected. They were sent to my lab. And we basically screened for an inflammatory uh, signature and profile. And if you were in a high inflammation um, group, then you were selected and enrolled in the study. And then those individuals were randomized two to one to treatment versus placebo group. It was a short study. I mean, it, it, this is um, a, a drug. In this case, we were doing it by infusion. And so um, there was eight weeks of treatment, eight weeks of follow-up. So it was a short study, really looking for um, safety study of, of this particular drug in, this, in ALS patients since it's never been tried before. Um, but then we were looking to see, well, if, if the drug was actually doing what it should do, it should impact IL-6 signaling. And so can we see evidence of changes in biomarker patterns based on the drug treatment? And so if we looked in the blood and looked at some of these cytokine levels, we didn't see changes in those unrelated to IL-6 signaling but we did see significant changes in IL-6 and another protein involved in this pathway called C-reactive protein. And what we also saw was that we saw a big increase in this soluble IL-6 recept uh, receptor. And this is exactly, so again, what we're seeing in placebo versus the treatment group is that when we have treatment group, we actually in, uh, detect increased amounts of IL-6 within the blood, which might sound counter intuitive um, to the hypothesis. But at the same time, we saw a big increase in the soluble IL-6 receptor. And actually the drug, this is exactly what we, sh what we would predict from uh, the course of drug treatment. Because when you treat uh, individuals with this drug, it binds to, this, to the IL-6 receptor on the cell surface. And what happens is you end up with a lot more of this soluble form that's made by the body and that binds all the IL-6 that's within the blood. And so while you're seeing an increased amounts of IL-6 in the soluble receptor, it's all non-functional, it doesn't work. But then what we saw was that it, it, in the presence of drug treatment, we saw this big decrease in the amount of C-reactive protein. So this is the exact pattern that we wanted to see. And in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, this is the type of of uh, biomarker signature that, that is detected. So that was very exciting. So we're actually getting evidence that when we treat patients with this drug, that we're getting um, a, a pattern of biomarkers that one would predict, indicating that it's actually, the drug is hitting its target and is doing what it should be doing. The surprising thing, which was actually even more exciting was that in um, some of these patients, we are collecting CSF at the beginning and at the end of the study. And so we looked at the CSF levels and wanted to see if there was any change in IL-6 and CRP there. And what we saw was that our changes mirrored exactly what we saw in the blood. So IL-6 was up, but the soluble receptor was up, so therefore it's not functioning. And then the CRP levels dropped. And so this was really exciting because the drug was giving by an infusion into the bloodstream. Um, so it really doesn't cross into the central nervous system very well. But what we're getting is actually a response into the central nervous system by only treating it within the blood. And so that's very exciting. And we're really interested in trying to move this forward into a larger um, phase study to actually look for impact and of efficacy of this drug in patients. So from this small study, what we, could, what we could say is, yep, it's safe and well tolerated. We didn't have any serious complications. Wasn't powered if we didn't look, look long enough for any clinical benefits. So we collected clinical uh, parameters, but the study wasn't designed to look for, the, for any clinical benefit. Um, what we did see, what, though, was that CRP levels um, were reduced um, in the presence of drug in both the CSF and um, in the plasma and that IL-6 responded exactly as it should as well. And so this is very exciting because now we can probably in the next study, again, look for levels of CRP and IL-6 as an inclusion criteria 
uh, for patients for the next study. And then some data I didn't get, uh, I didn't show was that we also did genotyping um, for the actual receptor because there is a variant within the general population. And what we found were, was that uh, patients that had a particular genotype for this receptor actually had the, uh, the best response um, to the drug. And so again, I think in the next trial, what we're gonna do is look and genotype this receptor, measure CRP and IL-6 levels, and be able to selectively target individuals that we think will best respond to the drug by using these biomarkers. So that's all um, very exciting and provides yet a, a new potential drug to take into, into the patient population. And again, the drug is already FDA approved. Um, and so it provides a more rapid, um, uh, uh, more rapid time frame to get into the patients and ultimately for hopefully for approval. In a general means ALS genetics, so I'm sure many of you have been following this, we have well over 30 genes that are linked to ALS as either causative or risk factors of the disease. Um, the most common one is this repeat expansion in this gene called C9ORF72. Um, obviously the first genetic mutations were identified um, in a gene called SOD1, which I've already mentioned. Um, but collectively, they're probably the two um, uh, most prevalent uh, mutations within um, ALS patients. So uh, a number of groups and companies are interested in targeting therapies based on these genetic alterations. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about three of them. And one is the SOD1 gene. Um, and clearly um, one would target then uh, familial cases, but there is potential that it might be useful in some of the sporadic population. Mutations obviously in this gene cause a toxic gain of function. And so therefore um, targeting these in the familial patients becomes um, um, an obvious choice. And the goal here is to try to lower levels of this mutant protein, because if it has a toxic function, then we should try to get rid of it. And if you lower the levels, it might be beneficial. The C9ORF72 gene, again, it's a, it's a repeat expansion, um, the most common familial form of ALS and frontal temporal dementia. And again, the idea is can we reduce some of the toxic mechanisms that actually cause the neuronal cell death? And then a third, uh, which is the ataxin 2 gene. And the interesting thing here is that there's a repeat expansion in ataxin 2 as well. And that is a, the, the amount of repeats um, is a risk factor for ALS, but the protein itself, ataxin 2 actually modulates um, TDP43 aggregation and inclusions. And these aggregation and inclusions are actually detected in, in around 95% of all ALS patients. And so it's possible that maybe we can target ataxin 2 in the sporadic pa uh, patient population to modulate TDP aggregation and inclusion that occurs in those patients. So how are we gonna do that? And how are people doing that? And they're using um, a newer technology called antisense oligonucleotides, um, abbreviated just ASOs. And I'm sure many of you here have already heard about what ASOs are and, and how they're being used. And now um, the Biogen study was published a few months back um, in the summer, and I'll review that um, data in a few minutes. But the idea here is that, okay, we have, uh, we're gonna use antisense oligos, and I'll describe those uh, a little more thoroughly in the next couple of slides. But again, SOD1 mutations cause ALS, and, this, and the mutant protein that can actually aggregate itself. Challenge is that SOD1 is actually made in every cell of your body. Um, but the loss of the protein is actually not lethal. And surprisingly, the mutation all, only causes ALS, even though it's, that mutant protein is made in every other cell of your body. The idea is, can we use these antisense oligos to knock down expression within the CNS? And we're going to use SOD1 levels in the cerebral spinal fluid as a biomarker to demonstrate that the ASO is actually doing what it should be doing and hitting its target. For the C9 gene, Again, most common genetic form of ALS and frontal temporal dementia. 
This is a repeat expansion. And the repeat expansion causes a, a number of different abnormalities. And one is it causes these little puncta of RNA within the nucleus, which might be bad. The second is it causes the translation of these novel dipeptide repeat proteins called DPRs that themselves are toxic to cells. And so the idea is, well, maybe we can use these antisense to sort of get rid of, try to get rid of this repeat expansion so that we don't make these uh, dipeptide repeat proteins that might be toxic. And finally, for a taxin two, as I mentioned, that repeat expansion size in taxin two is a risk factor for ALS. So the repeat length correlates to the risk of developing ALS, but actually not to the age of onset. Um, a taxin two functions both in cell stress responses, so how a cell responds to stress environments. And as I mentioned, it modulates TDP aggregation and the formation of TDP inclusions. So how do antisense oligos actually work? What, you know, why are these a great potential tool as a treatment for neurologic diseases? So backing up one second, so all of us within every nucleus of, our, uh, of the cell of, uh, within our body has DNA. Within different regions of the DNA are areas that encode for a particular gene. That gene actually gets what's called transcribed and made into something called a messenger RNA, which is now a single um, uh, strand molecule. That moves out, into, out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm of the cell, binds onto some, a structure called ribosomes, and that makes proteins. So you're basically going from DNA to mRNA to protein. And it's the proteins in our cells that do everything um, and control everything that happens in every cell of your body. So the proteins are what perform all the functions, the DNA encodes the protein, and the messenger RNA is in the middle. ASOs are made that target these specific messenger RNAs that are made from a gene. And so if we want to make a, an ASO that targets SOD1, we want to make an ASO that binds to the messenger RNA specifically for the SOD1 gene. And if you do that, you can regulate the amount of protein that's made from that messenger RNA. And it can do so in a number of ways, but this is just a little schematic of, of a couple of different ways and two of which that are useful for today. So again, here's that antisense oligonucleotide, the ASO, which is now this sort of uh, blue single structure panel uh, molecule, and it's gonna bind onto the messenger RNA of your gene of interest. And you can either do that to target it to happen within the nucleus, and the nucleus doesn't like RNA molecules that have two strands and it degrades them quickly. And so you can degrade and get rid of the messenger RNA for a gene of interest. Or you can make your antisense oligo that actually binds into different regions of your RNA that modulates how the gene is spliced together. And so maybe in this case for that C9, we're gonna modulate how the splicing happens and try to remove out that repeat expansion. So for the SOD1 gene and a taxon two, we're using this approach and we're gonna try to degrade it and get rid of it. Where with C9, we're gonna modulate it and try to get rid of the repeat expansion. ASOs can actually be delivered right into the bloodstream or can be directly um, inserted into the central nervous system. You typically use an intrathecal delivery approaches into the cerebral spinal fluid. And why would you do, want to do one versus the other? Well, if you deliver an antisense oligo into the blood, it doesn't cross over into the, into the central nervous system. So you won't impact anything that's happening within the CNS. The only way to get central nervous system impacts from these antisense is to put it directly into the, in, into the central nervous system. Now, if we're interested in SOD1, we want to be able to have a marker to demonstrate whether or not our antisense is having an impact and being and potentially effective in the individual. So um, published this uh, now a number of years ago. And really what we are doing here, our interest was can we measure SOD1 levels within cerebral spinal fluid? And the answer to that was yes. 
And if we looked at a group of ALS patients, the absolute level was different across individuals, but it remained constant over time. And so that was the really important take home that the levels remain fairly constant over time on any individual. And so, the, and so this becomes a great marker to look for an effect of the antisense oligo. Because if the antisense is put into the central nervous system and eliminates the messenger RNA for SOD1 specifically, then over time, we should see a reduction in the amount of SOD1 that we measure in the central nervous system, in this case of the CSF. And so it's a great marker to, sh to show that our antisense is actually doing what it should be doing. And so this is data from the Biogen study that was just published in July, um, using a, again, an antisense for SOD1 to ferrocin. And in this case, they looked at the impact of CSF SOD1 levels. And in their trial, they had a placebo in four treatment groups. The antisense was delivered again has to be put directly into the central nervous system. So intrathecal delivery at five different time points. And obviously as they're putting in the needle for the, for the delivery of their antisense, they extract a little bit of CSF before they put in the, the ASL. And so they can measure SOD1 levels at each of these time points. And so over time within the different groups, Placebo is, is blue and the lowest dose is green. You don't really see much change over time within those patients. But in patients receiving higher doses of tofaricin, one sees a reduction over time in the level of SOD1 that's measured in the CSF. So great data showing that their antisense is doing what it should be doing. It's reducing levels of SOD1 that's being measured within the central nervous system. Doesn't tell you if it's effective as a treatment, but it's doing what it should be doing. And again, this is the valuable tool of this biomarker. If you look at some of the patient clinical measures, and so this is one, um, uh, one figure from that um, study. And again, now they're looking at just ALS FRS scores or, or slow vital capacity or uh, muscle strength by, as measured by handheld dynamometry. And if they look at all the patients, Again, uh, placebo is in blue and um, the ASO treatment is in this orangish color. You can see, well, maybe there is some preservation of ALS score, um, but it's not significantly, uh, significantly different. There's a lot of overlap. Similar with uh, slow vital capacity, um, placebo group drops, but the um, um, ASO treatment group drops in a, in a slower or less degree, but again, it's not significantly different. Similar with handheld dominometry, um, so there doesn't seem to be much change over time. Again, this is a short study, only three months, um, where there is a smi uh, minor drop in the placebo group. After the, after the study was over though, they also separated out fast versus slow progressors. And in the bottom, if you only look at the fast progressor subgroup, what you see now are significant differences between the treatment group and the placebo group and the treatment group being the highest dose. And so again, suggesting that at its highest dose, um, this, does, this, this treatment is having an impact not only in the biomarker, but on clinical measures of disease progression. And finally, they looked at another biomarker. They looked at neurofilament proteins. Again, this is a marker um, <clears throat> that uh, is measuring neuronal injury and death. And again, over time, looking at um, either neurofilament heavy chain or light chain in the blood, what they saw was that by increasing doses of, of uh, deferrosin, one saw a reduction in neurofilament levels. So this is demonstrating a, a reduction in the damage and death of neurons in the central nervous system. So again, very promising studies uh, for this ASO for, for treatment of patients with SOD1 mutation. So very exciting. And again, the, the, showing you the promise and the, and the tremendous use and impact of biomarkers um, for both demonstrating um, target engagement, and in this case, also demonstrating uh, downstream measures of, of neuronal cell survival. So for the repeat expansion of C9, 
Again, this is a repeat expansion that occurs in the gene, actually within this uh, area called an intron. Don't really need to get into that. But again, when you have this repeat expansion, you get these little foci of, uh, within the nucleus of cells, um, which can be damaging. Um, but more importantly, what also causes this translation of these dipeptide repeat proteins called DPRs. And these DPRs can be toxic to cells. And so the idea was, can we create ASOs that would modulate um, the C9 mRNA and potentially reduce the amounts of DPRs that are being generated within, uh, within that cell? And so again, the idea is, can we use ASOs to treat the alteration of this repeat expansion? And then would, if we measure DPR levels in biofluids, could we show that by doing this, we can reduce the levels of DPRs that are being uh, produced within the cells? And so again, could DPR levels be this uh, pharmacodynamic biomarker for the treatment, uh, ASO treatment for C9 patients? So again, the idea is, well, can you measure DPRs and what happens over time? And so um, when that was done, again, this is one of the DPRs, which is just called a poly-GP. And again, when you look at the patient population, one sees um, uh, various levels within individuals, but over time that remains fairly constant. So sort of like the SOD1 level, it doesn't change much over time. And for this type of study, that's actually quite valuable. Because again, if the ASOs are working, then you should see a reduction in the levels of this uh, poly-GP over time. So this is just um, some data out of an animal model um, of the disease. Um, so it hasn't been tried, in, or it's just ongoing or will be ongoing in humans. But um, so we ha don't have any data from humans. So in this case, it was this, uh, the antisense was uh, provided to an animal model of the disease and looked in either the brain or in the cerebral spinal fluid. And so in this case, um, this is the repeat expansion. So two is normal, 66 is abnormal. And so if you only have two repeats, you don't detect any of these DPRs, this uh, poly GP. And if you have 66 repeats, um, you can detect increased levels within the brain, and this is looking at brain tissue. If you treated the mice, in this case, with um, the antisense oligo to C9, you got a reduction in the amount of um, the, the poly GP that's, I, that's detected within the brain. And if you look in the cerebral spinal fluid, you got the same, uh, same scenario, same uh, data, in that elevated levels um, within the CSF um, in animals that have the repeat expansion, but if the animals had the antisense oligo, it was reduced. And so again, this data is uh, informative and tells us that levels of this poly GP within the cerebral spinal fluid, again, might be a great biomarker for demonstrating target engagement and demonstrating that the ASO is doing what it should be doing. Finally, with ataxin 2, Again, this has only been done in an animal model of the disease. And in this case, it was an animal model for TDP43. Um, so overexpression of TDP43 causes um, inclusions, aggregates of TDP, and causes early death of the animal. And so in this case, the animals were treated with either um, a placebo or the antisense oligo. And <clears throat> on the left panel here, they're looking at survival of the animals. And so again, this transgenic mo uh, mouse model, uh, the mice unfortunately um, have to be sacrificed rather quickly um, after birth. But in the presence of one-time treatment with the, with the antisense oligo, uh, many of these animals survive much longer. So there's a tremendous improvement of survival and a reduction in the loss of motor function at early time points. Unfortunately, we haven't yet, no one's developed a um, assay that measures a taxin-2 protein in biofluids. So we don't yet have a good biomarker to follow and monitor a taxin-2 protein levels in patients. So this is an area that work is required. <clears throat> so in summary, 
Um, biomarkers are, are tremendously useful in an aid for diagnosis, um, either genetic mutations, obviously, neurofilament is another great biomarker that can help there. Genetic mutations and or other biomarkers can be used to select patients for particular types of treatment, um, either ASOs or gene therapies for these genetic mutations or specific drug treatments for, in the case of the inflammatory cytokines. And this uh, gene expression profile or protein expression profile of biomarkers can be used to really enrich for patients within a particular type of pathway that then is targeted for drug treatment. And so really selecting patients to enroll in clinical trials. And I think by this method, we'll actually get a much faster and a much deeper understanding on whether or not certain drugs are effective in ALS patients. A number of these biomarkers that can be used as pharmacodynamic markers to demonstrate target engagement of the drug treatment. Um, obviously, these, these biomarkers are having key roles now in drug development for ALS and in improving the, the trial design for ALS. And the combinations of markers, which can include genetics, it can include proteins, also can, can include digital types of biomarkers, um, speech analytics, thing, things of that nature might provide the optimal panel for target selection and for trial monitoring. And finally, again, uh, continued efforts. We really need this continued enrollment of, of patients um, in our clinical research studies. Um, we have another um, longitudinal biomarker study that's gonna kick off um, any moment now. COVID has really delayed us quite some time that's funded by Target ALS. And here again, we're doing longitudinal clinical measures, collecting biofluids, which will be blood, CSF, and urine. Um, and then doing, especially because of COVID, at-home measures. A lot of at-home measures of speech and actually of um, uh, vital capacity. So we're gonna do um, uh, spirometry measures actually at home. Um, so that's gonna be exciting for this study. Many of these patients were trying to feed in our, our postmortem tissue banking program. So obviously having tissues of, um, from patients are critical um, in the continued um, development uh, and expansion of potential mechanisms for, for the underlying causes of ALS and target new targets for drug treatment. And just mention a few other longitudinal clinical um, uh, measures and longitudinal studies create, which is down uh, with Michael Benatar um, at the University of Miami, a number of different pre-fouled studies. So again, these are uh, studies that are studying, uh, that are investigating longitudinal measures of individuals that harbor uh, genetic mutations that cause ALS. And then ultimately, I think, uh, you know, where, where I'd like to see us go is a precision medicine programs that include lots of different markers and trying to optimize treatment for individual patients. And really I see that I see us going in this way, looking at clinical features and, and biomarkers, really helping and guide uh, patient diagnosis very early. And then a multitude of measures, either genetics, whole genome sequencing, RNA sequencing, that obviously might identify those quickly for treatments for either antisense or other gene therapy types of approaches that are again upcoming. Um, lots of different um, biomarker collections, either blood, CSF, imaging, um, speech, um, environmental factors, lifestyle factors. I think these all have to be sort of fed into different artificial intelligence types of algorithms that'll help us um, better define optimal treatment uh, paradigms or enroll into um, specific clinical trials. But I also want to include patient-derived cells drug screens on those cells, um, which might ultimately lead to repurposing of already approved drugs or taking new hits and again, putting them into these sort of AI approaches to identify next generation of drugs and targets and pathways. Um, clearly some of this is ongoing, uh, patient-derived cells, uh, Answer ALS um, has done this for, for a thousand ALS patients and collecting cells, trying to characterize those cells um, this, this approach, you know, we, for the last few years, we pushed this approach on an individual patient. Um, and, and so we do have uh, data showing that we can do this. We can actually do this on an individual patient, 
taking patient derived cells and doing drug screens and putting the individual on particular drugs based on their um, particular cells and um, outcomes from drug screens. It's costly and it's time consuming. And so we're trying to learn new and improved ways to sort of reduce costs and reduce the timeline such that ultimately we can do this in a much more rapid manner um, so that we can optimize treatment decisions on individual patients. And with that, just want to acknowledge individuals from my lab that, that have done a number of, of the studies, um, other collaborators, both at the Barrow and other institutions, including Wake Forest, Mayo Clinic, University of Miami, um, other work that was done at Iron Horse Diagnostics, and ultimately the funding support from a multitude of different funding agencies that, that is critical um, for us to continue our efforts and move forward um, and ultimately define um, better and improved treatments for ALS. And with that, I will stop and, and hopefully have some time for questions. That was wonderful. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bowser. I want to introduce myself. My name is Sarah. Um, I'm one of the Everything ALS um, team members and, and one of the moderators for tonight. Uh, James is also going to be moderating both our questions we received before this uh, presentation and some that we received in the chat. I do want to mention we have received a lot of questions for you. Uh, everyone is very interested about your discussion. So um, we have kind of picked the ones that we can, I know, get to just to respect your time. But um, I am asking if maybe if I send you a few through an email, if you're, if you have the time, I know you're very busy to um, be willing to answer some of those because I know we have plenty that want to get answered, but we do want to be um, mindful of your time too. So. Uh, Sarah, I'd be happy. So you, you can send whatever we don't get to, um, just send them to me and I'll, I'll answer them and, and send them back to you and, and you can relay yeah. it to the group. Okay, wonderful. So for anybody who didn't, who doesn't have their question answered, it will get to it. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Um, the first question uh, is what steps are do have to happen in order to get validated biomarker for ALS? Uh, um, well, validation, I mean, there, there's uh, many ways to answer that question. So that's a big question. So validation for the assay itself. Um, so that ultimately has to happen. Typically, you get validation by, um, I, I'd rather not call it validation, more verification by getting other groups to sort of um, get the same answer that you do on that biomarker. So can you have multiple groups from, you know, around the world sort of look at a particular biomarker and sort of the consensus is, yep, that's changed, that's different, that's whatever. That's really critical and that's only occurred on a few different markers. Um, so that's the first level of sort of validation in, in that respect. Then the next step is validating the assay itself, which now out of the small group that have been sort of verified or validated amongst the field, um, you know, the numbers of assays that have been validated are, are almost, you know, two or three. Um, and really um, the only ones in ALS that I know that are actually validated have been done at Iron Horse um, because it takes time and money to do that because there is just um, a, a pathway that is really a sort of a industry-wide and accepted pathway to validate an assay. Um, so that, that sort of are the steps. It, take, it does take time to validate an assay. And then once that gets validated, then that has to get incorporated and used. Um, and so it, it is unfortunately a very timely and costly endeavor. Uh, hi, Dr. Bowser, James here. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we always have a lot of uh, people on these uh, Zoom meetings who wanna get involved. And so my question is, is how and where can patients get involved in biomarker studies? Is there a specific exclusion or inclusion criteria? And can patients be in other clinical studies while participating in these biomarker studies? Yeah, great question, James. Thanks, thank you for it. Um, the quick nutshell, which is really good, is for biomarker studies, we take anyone that's willing to participate. So um, really not no real exclusion criteria. Can you be in other clinical trials? Absolutely. Um, and we actually sometimes, um, um, you know, piggyback on clinical trials. 
And because a lot of the clinical trials are collecting these same fluids. And so we can piggyback on that and it's actually beneficial for everyone. So no, we, you know, within the records, obviously we know if you're in say a SOD1 anti-sense trial, um, you know, that's in the records and we'll know it. So you can be in any trial you want and still participate in, in clinical research studies. Um, you know, where, where are they? The biomarker related studies? Uh, that's a, that, that's a good question. I mean, I know of about 10 or 20 sites that are really involved in different types of biomarker related studies. Um, happy to provide a list of, of the known sites that I'm aware of in upcoming trials and or upcoming studies. And so, you know, many of them are either single or, or small numbers of sites. So I mentioned that target ALS one that'll start, we have seven sites, um, for that. And so that's actually a pretty big one. Um, for this type of study, but um, but happy to provide that information. Thank you. Great. Yes, I will definitely. If you can include that at the with those question answers, I would be very grateful. They're um, making note of that, so I'll remember to. Yes, remember. absolutely. I definitely will because that's super. I important. just want to say I see 120. This is incredible. Um, quite a group. Very. We've impressive. up to 138 during your presentation. So we've. Wow. we've it's getting late on the East Coast. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> we'll have to see how many people uh, watch it. We'll have to watch the numbers and send that to you too, because I know a lot of people watch it afterwards. But um, our third question is, has there been any difference seen in biomarkers for familial or versus sporadic ALS? I know you talked about it in your presentation, but in terms of differentiating that may not necessarily be a genetic test, is there maybe a biomarker that specifically can say one way or the other? Yeah, um, there so far has not been a single biomarker. Um, and there's not enough work done in looking at combinations and see if that works a little better. And so we've done a little bit of studies in that regard, but um, the unfortunate thing is we have far more um, samples from sporadic patients than familial patients. And so when you start to do those types of studies it, you need a larger number of the familial patients in so I, we, I don't have anything I can hang my hat on and say, yep, this is it. Um, but we are looking for those because those become very informative with respect to types of mechanisms that are ongoing in familial groups that may or may not be happening in a sporadic population. Kind of segues into the next question. Um, so are you measuring biomarkers for family members who have a mutation, but no phenotype onset yet? And what about the digital uh, biomarkers as well? Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I was collaborating with Michael Benatar for those, for that study. Um, I, I've only had very few um, asymptomatic mutation carriers. Um, because I haven't been running a study for that because that's they're hard to find and so and, and hard to enroll. Um, so we have very few of those. And then um, the second part, what, oh, now I forget James, what was the second part? That's okay. Uh, the question is, um, what about the digital biomarkers? Ah, digital one, yeah. I almost tried to include some data and, I'm, I, and I was worried I was going to go too long. Um, the digital biomarkers are really exciting, especially in this era of COVID. Um, I, I work, have been working with a company called Oro Analytics, which is doing a lot of speech analytics um, and can really identify changes that are occurring incredibly early, um, even in patients that themselves and their family members say have no speech abnormalities, they can pick that out you know, fairly easily. But the interesting thing is especially because of COVID and, uh, you know, due to the challenges of patients going into the clinic now, um, they're using speech measures and being able to make correlations and predictions to um, respiratory measures and ALS FRS measures. Um, so I think there's really upcoming exciting times in using some of the digital measures um, in lieu of measures that you typically do at the clinic. And so in our upcoming study, we're doing the at-home spirometry measures because we wanna do a head-to-head -head of how well patients can get respiratory measures at home while coached um, versus being in the clinic. And so we're gonna get head-to-head -head measures there and then also all the speech measures in order to try to correlate that with the respiratory measures. And so it'll be exciting. And I think 
the next couple of years uh, for digital markers for ALS, are, you're going to see a big explosion. So Dr. Bowser, um, I'm Indu Navar, uh, one of the founders of uh, Everything ALS, and I work with the team here. I just wanted to let you know, we do have a speech uh, IRB approved study. Um, so we have got 100 participants and our goal is in January, we'll have 250 participants and we work very closely with uh, James Berry and Ernest Frankel um, oh, yeah. on our study. So we, we'll, we'll talk uh, offline about it, but um, maybe there's a way to collaborate here. Yeah, and absolutely. our goal is to bring in digital biomarkers. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. love to talk to you more about that. Perfect. Yeah, and you're working with great people. Love James and Frank. Yes, we love them. Thank you. All right. Um, in terms of biomarkers for limb onset versus bulbar, I know we have said already that there isn't specific individual biomarkers, but um, is there a way that maybe neurofilaments specifically because of the different types of neurons, maybe affect one versus the other? Um, yeah, so they have not worked great for specifically limb versus bulbar. We can see trends in the, tr the there's a trend um, for, for the bulbar onset patients, um, but you know it, it's not to the degree of specificity that I'd like to see. Um, so we, so not really a great differential between just limb and, and bulbar onset, um, though definitely a number of them, not surprisingly, as you might imagine, are higher in the limb onset patients than in the bulbar onset. Okay. Um, next question is, have you studied the difference in biomarkers for people that have been exposed to various hypothesized environmental exposures associated with ALS, such as heavy metal exposure, PFAs, diesel fumes, et cetera? Yeah, we published a few papers probably about 10 to 12 years ago looking um, at and trying to answer some of those questions. Um, we, we did not find great biomarkers that were really linked well with that. And I think some of the challenges are um, you know, you're looking at environmental factors that you might have an exposure, which might have been a year, two years, 10 years prior. The biomarkers we're measuring are turned over um, in a fairly rapid manner. And so being able to look backwards in time to that degree, I don't think we're going to do that with the current sort of fluid based markers that we're doing. The way you might be able to do that is actually some of the genetic impact. So if you have epigenetic changes that occur based on environmental factors, that you can see. Um, another thing we tried to do, but we didn't have enough data on, is um, some of the environmental exposures and toxins uh, leave their mark in bone. And so we are trying to do some, um, some scans on bone, but we didn't have enough patients to do it. And so we didn't have enough data to report. Um, but that would be another way. But the, really the big challenge is trying to look back years um, uh, when the exposure might have occurred. That's really interesting. I'd never thought about looking at bone. That's what, <laughs> I'm gonna have to go read those studies now. <laughs> we actually see it, we haven't published this yet either. There's a very little, very small amount of literature, right, 20 years ago. Um, if you look post-mortem, so I do a lot of post-mortem, uh, I run a post-mortem uh, tissue bank. And so, you know, we, we do autopsies on patients all the time. Um, there are bone changes in patients with ALS. And the significance of those bone changes are correlated to the length of time of the disease. Again, completely unpublished, you're the first to hear. And now everyone knows, damn it. Now everyone knows. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Dr. Don't Bowser, uh, very curious, did you see the um, bone changes before the diagnosis? I mean, of course, you didn't, you didn't probably get the samples, but do you predict no. that it started before? Um, based on what I can tell you, really, I don't, I don't think so. Um, so I think the changes are probably late in the disease. Um, okay. That's my guess. But because it's a postmortem, um, type of study, you know, I, I don't have anything at, at the very early time points of the disease. But since I also think it, it's correlated to the length of time you had the disease, that's also more indicative of a change that's happening late in the disease. Got part. it. Got it. 
Oh, thank you. It could be something to do with calcium levels would be my guess. Okay. Um, so this question kind of relates to what's been happening recently. Uh, the big news that we've all been waiting for was that Brainstorm recently announced their results um, and said that they, uh, the CSF biomarker analysis confirmed neuron resulted in a statistically significant. Um, can you explain what that means and what that may mean for the future? Yeah, the brain, I, I have not looked hard at, at the brainstorm data. Um, so I'd have to look at, at that and maybe send you comments subsequent. Okay. But I gonna, don't want to say too much right now since I, I'm not that from, I've seen early data, but I have not seen what they just reported. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, to go kind of to a more general sense, uh, in your opinion, what are the three most important biomarkers you believe should be tested if someone believes that they may have ALS? Ooh, that they may have ALS. Uh, neurofilament would be one, without a doubt. That's still the best marker out there. Um, if they may have ALS. See, now it, the challenge becomes there's so many other mechanisms. Um, so I wouldn't, I would not stick with just like one or two or three. So I have my top list of about 15. Um, and that covers a multitude of different pathways. And so I, I'm sort of interested in how those change within different types of patient populations. So again, but even of those 15, neurofilament's the best for making predictions of ALS or not. All the rest are not tremendously informative for specificity of ALS, but really help put you over the top on, on which might be underlying pathways that are driving the disease in the individual. So then to follow that up, sorry, James, I'm adding a question. Uh, what about during the disease? I, I mean, we have a lot of patients on here tonight. What are some biomarkers that you recommend they get monitored throughout their disease process? Yeah. Um, I mean, you need neurofilament usually about once or maybe twice. I, you don't need that every time because it stays fairly constant. Um, and so that that's a good one for a, diff, or a, a few different reasons. Um, there are a, a few of the inflammatory cytokines that I that were up on one or two of those figures that I showed. Um, and those are hitting actually a few different um, distinct inflammatory pathways. And so what I think we need to do better, a better job of is um, to collect this type of information on individuals so that we can start to bend people into this person is predominantly their disease is being driven in this manner. Um, then having drugs that target some of those pathways, that's, those are the people that you quickly pop into those types of studies. So at the moment, we don't do a good job at all, and it's mainly due to costs of trying to follow a number of things in a lot of individuals um, so that we can quickly sort of bend people into pathways. But I'm, you know, from what we've seen on trying to do sort of personalized medicine approaches, I really think that if we did this on a big scale in ALS, we could take this very heterogeneous disease and start to bend people and create classifications of the disease that then you can target with, with specific therapies. Um, hey, Sarah, can I just jump in for a second? This is Michelle. Oh, James, I'm sorry. That's I'm okay. I'm going to ask Dr. Bowser, on the um, neuron study, I know you don't have the data yet, but the two biomarkers that had the robust readout were neurofilament light and MCP1. Can you at least tell us like what those do? Because the whole community is kind of trying to figure out what those really <laughs> reflect, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, well, I mean, neurofilament, obviously, that's, that's a neuronal damage and death. So... Um, a reduction in neurofilament would dem would show that you're getting a reduction of injury and death of neurons. So that's obviously a very good thing. Um, MCP1, it actually functions in, in a multitude of different inflammatory pathways. Um, I don't know if they measured that in blood or in CSF. Um, it's definitely raised in most patients and it's one it of those things I like to look at, CSF. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and it's, it's, it, it functions in a number of different pathways. 
um, some that are directly inflammatory in nature, others that are involved in the migration and, and trying to stimulate cells, um, other inflammatory cells to come into the area. You know, something is bad here. Um, and so you're, you, that helps to sort of amplify the, the inflammatory process because now you're trying to, to influence and, and get cells to migrate into this area. Um, and, and so a reduction in that would also be uh, interesting in that now you're going to reduce a general inflammatory response um, in the patients then, and potentially slow the migration of uh, particular inflammatory cell types into the disease area. Pretty good explanation. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, what correlation do biomarkers have with ALSFSR scores and with forced vital capacity? Uh, well, it depends on the marker. Um, the, the best one that tracks, well, I mean, still neurofilament is sort of the best one that tracks because you can predict rates of disease progression, um, which obviously then correlates with ALSFRS measures, which correlate with respiratory measures. Um, but then you, you end up with that conundrum on respiratory measures because then you, if you have bulbar impact patients and then that starts to change the signatures a bit. Um, and so really, you know, you're looking at ALSFRS and, and really the best one for that is still neurofilament. Um, and its ability to do that. Many of the other ones, especially some of the cytokines, don't work very well to do that. Um, so I know that you're part of the ALS Untangled, and um, I know you met McFinn at the beginning of this talk. He's uh, one of those ALS reversals. Okay. You may not have known that. Wow. But... I did not know that. So, yeah, so he's kind of our inspiration for us all. Um, yeah. I know there are others too. Has there been any research or it, would there be any research in biomarkers of these patients of ALS reversal to see um, what their numbers may be and, and where they lay on the spectrum of neurofilaments and other things like that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if anyone has ever done that. And I mainly because the, you know, the reversals are very small in number. And I didn't know any until just now. Um, so yeah, I mean, if we can get you to enroll at least to get blood samples, that would be wonderful. Um, but uh, the, the real challenge has been, you know, trying to track down those individuals, confirming that they, they actually did have the symptoms and then it's, it's reversed. Um, the numbers have just been really too small to do a real study on. I mean, obviously, I think Rick, Rick Badlack does the best job at trying to identify and track down those individuals and verify a reversal. And so, you know, my hat's off to all the work that he's doing there. And yes, I'm part of Untangled. I'm a sort of tag along on Rick. Um, you know, he does most of the work there. But um, so, yeah, the problem has just been, there's been so few that um, trying to study those individuals, I, no one's done that, that I'm aware of. We can definitely get you some help on getting records for those or some meet those, some of those people. We uh, get to work with them a lot. And I know in my you know own journey through my family's ALS, this has been a, an eye-opening experience to meet McFinn and, and others like him. So um, we'll definitely talk about I that. I personally know probably about 20 people, so we could get you some. Wow. Contacts. It, they have a documented diagnosis. Of yeah, ALS. they were all documented by, uh, by Bedlock. By Rick. They're all okay. documented reversals, including McFinn, as he shows us. He's <laughs> number 42 of the 48. Wow. And yeah, uh, Dr. Bedlock confirmed that he's got uh, about 100, not full reversals, but pretty close. But mm -hmm. he did not call them reversals, but a lot of them had recovered their uh, functions. Yeah, I always wonder, um, you know, what, what, did they, what did the individual actually have? Um, did they have ALS or did they have some other sim uh, some other um, disease that was causing symptoms like ALS and then that disease resolved, you know, if it was, say, viral or some other um, inducer of a motor neuron phenotype, um, and then that resolved, and so now they're better, but they didn't have ALS, they had something else. 
Um, so I know Rick works hard to try to identify or differentiate one versus the other. Definitely a, a huge reason to keep this biomarker uh, research going because that might be able to um, solidify this, you know, Dr. Bedlack's findings and, and yeah. keep, keep finding more. Yeah, we definitely have a group of markers that should be up if someone's diagnosed with ALS. Um, to kind of bring it back in, um, again, we got a lot of eager people here. Is the test to measure the elevated levels of NFH available commercially? Um, is it FDA approved and is it covered by insurance most importantly? <laughs> yes. So it's not yet FDA approved. Um, COVID has sort of disrupted where we were going there. We were hoping to be at the FDA in the fall and then that's completely destroyed a timing of lots of things. Um, so no, it's not FDA approved. So it's not covered by insurance. Um, you know, we're offering it as uh, a pay for type of service. Um, and so that's where we're at at the moment. And, you know, a lot of the insurance, especially for, well, even when it's FDA approved, you know, you're really dealing with insurance groups in trying to get uh, cost recovery reimbursement. So it's a lot of reimbursement challenges with different insurance companies. Um, as you mentioned, you're a reviewer on ALS Untangled and of the supplements and off-label therapies that you've looked at, um, can you tell us a few that you think maybe hold some promise in helping support cellular function? Um, wow, I'm trying to think back on all the ones that we've looked at is the vast majority of what we've looked at are more like more debunking than anything else. Um, Petco was one that you covered. And I know that's part of the Amelix study. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and Tudka, I mean, by itself, um, there were some interesting little snippets that might have been worth the look at. Um, but um, again, the combination, I mean, it's interesting. The Amelix study is another interesting um, outcome. And, um, you know, the biomarkers in that study, they looked at neurofilm and it didn't change it in any meaningful way. And so, you know, what does that mean for M for, for their combination drug therapy? But Tudka by itself had some interesting individual studies, but the totality of it would suggest probably doesn't do much. I'm gonna try to dissect this next question here, so bear with me. Are uh, any of the CSF biomarkers correlated with other objective clinical data or tests? I believe, for example, early diagnostic and new tracking methods other than ALS, FRS. Um, but wait a minute, say that again, James. So are any of the uh, CSF-based biomarkers Basically, are any of the CSF biomarkers correlated with other objective clinical data or tests? Oh, um, I mean, in, in general, yes. I mean, it, it's more of an aid for diagnosis, like I said, than a strict diagnosis only because it's not specific for just ALS. Um, so uh, yes, those CSF markers um, correlate to different drops in ALS FRS and things of that measure of, of that indication. But um, in, you know, we've published data showing um, neurofilament levels correlating to specific numbers on the ALS FRS scale. So yeah, that data exists. And so there, there is um, some, you know, tight data or good data is suggesting that these measures are uh, correlated to the typical clinical parameters that are used. Um, that, it, you know, it makes it very challenging um, going forward to the FDA as well, because, you know, what are you comparing your biomarker against? You're comparing it against the clinical measures from the neurologist in patients that are being diagnosed. And so it's, you know, it's a, it becomes a harder sell to the, to the FDA on, well, you're, you're, gold standard is the clinical measure, which is pretty good. Um, and so how are you demonstrating that it's better than what the neurologist already can do? And so that's why it's a, sort of an aid for diagnosis. We think it'll be really in, helpful early on when patients, depending on the time course of when they come into that clinic, um, 
the clinician might say, oh yeah, you have these sort of signs instead of waiting another six months to see if you've progressed on all these scales. Um, if we had this measure in addition, that would push me right over the, you know, over the hurdle. And I say, yes, this is, this is ALS. Let's enroll you in a, in a trial. And so that's, that's really the goal of some of these studies in biomarkers. Well, for our last question here, and like I said, everything will be sent to you later to answer what you can. We appreciate your time and, and are grateful for any and all. So, uh, um, but our, our last question here is, do you believe in the need for an expanded access program for people with ALS? And also on clinical trials, how often does exclusion criteria prevent people from participating? We know that it happens. So is it more well, often than we think? Well, yeah, I mean, in clinical trials in general, yeah, it happens all the time, obviously. There's exclusion criteria. I think that especially now, um, it's even more problematic because a lot of the studies that are moving towards approval are all in patients that are more rapidly progressing. And so they're specifically tuning into the more fast progressors, which, you know, for the industry makes sense because if you're only going to treat them for a short period of time, you want patients that show a change. Um, and so those are going to be the fast progressors. And so I, I can understand that, uh, you know, why they want to enroll patients with that type of phenotype, clinical phenotype. Um, but, you know, because of that, you end up excluding the, you know, what could be the vast majority of patients. Um, so expanded access, yeah, I would, you know, I think, I think there's a good need for that in, in the world of ALS and potentially providing opportunities for patients that are now excluded from other trials um, because of those uh, criteria to uh, become involved and to, to hopefully get the benefit of potential drugs. Um, you know, there's, all, there's lots of other challenges, regulatory, industry-wide, cost associated, all those, all those things, but I think we can, as a, as a community, overcome those. Um, but, but yeah, I see a good role for that. Well, on that and all of these wonderful questions and information, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Bowser, for coming and speaking with us tonight. This has been very informative, and I know um, I will have to re-watch re some of this and so I can absorb all this wonderful, wonderful and great information. Um, <laughs> as everyone knows, now we come to our uh, open forum section. Dr. Bowser, you're more than welcome to stay if you would like to uh, hear what the community has to say, but um, we do respect your time and, and understand. So. Uh, thank you so much again from everything ALS and, and everyone here for spending your Wednesday night with us. Absolutely. So thank you so much for having me. Really enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to hang on for at least a few minutes. Uh, awesome. Very interested to see what happens. But great, great community, great uh, group of people that, that all you know, are spending their evening listening to me. And hopefully I was informative. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. I also want to let everybody know that we have Shannon Carey from Compassionate Care ALS on the call to help with any of um, any maybe caregiving type questions. So I just wanted to let everyone know she's on. Thanks again, Dr. Bowser. That was so informative and awesome. And I hope everybody got a ton out of that. I'm sure everyone did. There's a lot.